the ruling class. Elementi di scienza politica. Gaetano Mosca. Translation by Hannah D. Kahn. Edited and revised, with an introduction, by Arthur Livingston. 1896. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 8. Revolution. 1. We have just examined the ways in which the currents of ideas, sentiments, passions, that contribute to changing trends in human societies arise and assert themselves. But it is also observable that at times these currents gain the upper hand by force, replacing the individuals who are in power with other individuals who represent new principles. In societies that have attained a fairly complicated type of organization, such changes may occur on the initiative, or at any rate with the consent, of the normally ruling class, which, in ordinary cases, holds exclusive possession of arms. Then again they may be brought about by other social elements and forces, which succeed in defeating the previously ruling element. Then a phenomenon that has been rather frequent in the history of our time appears, the thing that is commonly called revolution. Upheavals in small states, where a bureaucratic organization does not exist or is essentially embryonic, bear only a superficial resemblance to upheavals in large states, and especially states like our modern nations. In classical antiquity when a tyrant became master of a city, or an oligarchy superseded a democracy and often, too, when a tyranny or oligarchy was overthrown, it was always at bottom a question of one clique, more or less numerous, superseding another clique in the management of the commonwealth. When the Greek state was functioning normally the whole governing class, in other words everybody who was not a slave or a resident alien or a manual laborer, had a share in political life. When a tyrannical or oligarchical regime was established, or even a degenerate form of democracy that was called oclocracy, one element in the governing class usurped all power to the detriment of other elements, which were in part killed off, in part despoiled of their property and exiled. The victors, in their turn, had to fear reprisals from the vanquished, for if the latter ever succeeded in getting the upper hand again, they treated their former despoilers in the same manner. The struggle was therefore conducted on a basis of force and cunning, with murders and surprises, and the parties to the struggle often sought the support of outsiders or of some few mercenaries. Once victorious, they usually seized the citadel and deprived all who were not of their faction of their weapons. Arms were rather costly in those days and could not easily be replaced. On rare occasions, as was the case with the coup d'état of Pelopidas and Epaminondas at Thebes, and that of Timoleon at Syracuse, someone would use a victory to establish a less sanguinary and less violent regime. But even then such a beneficent innovation would last only as long as the personal influence or the life of its author lasted. Sometimes, again, the usurping faction would succeed in keeping itself in power for more than a generation. That was the case with Pisistratus and his sons, and with the two Dionysuses, tyrants of Syracuse. Agathocles, one of the worst tyrants known to Greek history, died an old man, and he had seized power as a youth. Poison alone seemed able to cut short his life and his rule. The usages of the ancient Hellenic state were reborn in the Italian communes of the Middle Ages, where the political organization was very much like that of classic Greece. A faction with some noblemen at its head would seize power and banish all its enemies or murder them. In either case their property would be confiscated. Often one had to crush if one did not care to be crushed. As a rule the two richest and strongest families of the commune would contend Armada Manu for supremacy. They too, like the heads of the old Greek parties, used outside aid and mercenaries whenever they could. So the Toriani and the Visconti disputed possession of Milan, and the scene, with few variations, was repeated in smaller Italian cities. Pieces, truces, tearful reconciliations, religious repentances, were sometimes engineered by monks and honest citizens. Dino Campagni in his chronicles relates how he tried, and apparently with success, to reconcile the heads of the white and black parties in Florence, bringing them together in church and inducing them, with appropriate words, to embrace each other. But such maneuvers, however well-intentioned, had only momentary effects. Worse still, they were often mere stratagems by which the bigger rascals would get the better of the smaller ones by striking at them when they were off their guard and unable to defend themselves. With the advent of the Renaissance, ways became less warlike and open conflict rarer, but perfidy and betrayal grew still more subtle, and long practice lifted them almost to the rank of sciences. In some cities so-called civilized manners prevailed. In Florence, for instance, the powerful drew together by kinship and maintained a certain balance, keeping their predominance by stuffing the purses the equivalent of modern European election lists, with the names of their henchmen. That policy was followed, as long as Niccolo Duzano was alive, by the mercantile oligarchy that had the Albizzi at its head. It was the policy also of Cosimo de' Medici and his colleagues, though Cosimo was adept at using other devices on occasion.
Elsewhere, in Romania and Umbria, wars that were mere struggles between gangs and gangsters dragged on until after 1500. In Perugia, the Odi were driven out by the Baglioni, but came back by surprise one night. The Baglioni fought in their shirt tails and came off best. Victorious, they turned and exterminated each other. Alivarado de Fermo, at the head of a band of cutthroats, won lordship over his city by murdering his uncle and other notables of the town, who had invited him to a friendly dinner. In the civil conflicts that took place in the Greek cities and in the Italian communes, moderation and humaneness were not useful traits of character. Power went as a rule to the quickest and the slyest, to those who could dissemble best and had the toughest consciences. Chance, too, played a great part in the successful outcome of an undertaking, and many romantic episodes are recounted in this connection. A barking dog, a drinking bout an hour earlier or an hour later, a letter read in time or left unopened till the next day, determined the outcome of a surprise, as when Epaminondas and Pelopidas gained control of Thebes, and Aratus of Sicyon. It is also interesting to note that neither the civil strife that tormented the Greek states nor the factional wars that kept the Italian communes in turmoil made any perceptible contributions to civilization. Rulers changed, but whoever triumphed, society always kept the same social physiognomy. The great phenomena in history the rise of Hellenic science and art, the emancipation of serfs, the rebirth of arts and letters at the end of the Middle Ages, developed independently of the bloody struggles that tortured Greece and Italy. At the most, these civil conflicts helped to retard the maturing of such movements, functioning in that respect like foreign wars, famines or pestilences, which impoverish and prostrate a country and so rarely fail to hamper its economic and intellectual progress. A political science based exclusively upon observation of the historical periods to which we have referred could not help being incomplete and superficial, and those are the traits of the method embodied in Machiavelli's celebrated essay on the prince. That work has been too much reviled and too much praised. In any event, whether in praise or in blame, too great an importance has been attached to it. If some observer in our day were to note the ways in which private fortunes are made and unmade on our stock exchanges, in our corporations or in our banks, he could easily write a book on the art of getting rich that would probably offer very sound advice on how to look like an honest man and yet not be one, and on how to thieve and rob and still keep clear of the criminal courts. Such a book would, one may be sure, make the precepts that the Florentine secretary lays down in his essay look like jests for innocent babes. Even so, as we have already suggested, chapter 1, section 1, such a work would have nothing to do with economic science, just as the art of attaining power and holding it has nothing to do with political science. That such things have no bearing on science, in other words on the discovery of the great psychological laws that function in all the large human societies, is easily proved. Machiavelli's suggestions might have served Louis the Moor or Cesar Borgia, just as they might have served Dionysius, Agathocles and Jason of Foray. They might have served the Ds of Algiers, or Ali Tvelin, or even Mehmet Ali when he exclaimed that Egypt was up for sale on the auction block to the man who made the last bid in dollars or saber cuts. But one cannot be sure that the art taught by Machiavelli has any practical value in itself, or that even the statesman mentioned would have derived any great profit from it. When the question of winning power and holding it is involved, knowledge of the general laws that may be deduced from a study of human psychology, or of the constant tendencies that are revealed by the human masses, does not help very much. The important thing at such times is quickly and readily to understand one's own abilities and the abilities of others, and to make good use of them. Such things vary so widely that they cannot be covered by general rules. A piece of advice may be good for one man, if he knows how to take proper advantage of it, and very bad for another. The same person acting in the same way in two apparently identical cases will fare now well now badly according to the different people with whom he happens to be dealing. Guicciardini well says, theory is one thing and practice another, and many understand the former without being able to put it into operation. Nor does it help much to reason by examples, since every little change in the particular case brings on great changes in the consequences. Certainly Machiavelli's precepts would have been of little use to the statesmen of the Roman Republic, and they would serve the statesmen of modern Europe very badly indeed. However, to avoid any misunderstanding, we had better agree that rectitude, self-sacrifice, good faith, have never been anywhere or at any time the qualities that best serve for attaining power and holding it, nor is the situation any different today. It need hardly be pointed out that in modern states, which are far larger in size than the ancient and have their complicated organization, their bureaucracies, their standing armies, no revolution can be achieved with a dagger thrust in somebody's back, with a well-laid ambush, with a well-planned attack on a public building. When modern revolutionists take their cue from the practices of their ancient predecessors, they fall into gross errors of anachronism.
classical reminiscences, to be sure, are not wholly useless. They fire the souls of the youthful and serve to maintain a revolutionary atmosphere. They were cleverly exploited in that sense away back in the Renaissance, for instance, in the preparation of the Conspiracy of 1476, which encompassed the assassination of Galeazzo Sforza. To kill a king may not be enough to overturn a government today, but political assassinations still help, sometimes, to inspire leaders of a governing class with hesitation or terror and so make them less energetic in action. Almost all political assassins lose their lives in the execution of their enterprises. Many of them become martyrs to an idea and consequence, and the veneration that is eventually paid them is one of the less honorable but not least effective means of keeping revolutionary propaganda alive. 2. Of all the ancient states, Republican Rome was the one in which juridical defense was most solidly established, and in which civil strife was, therefore, least bloody and least frequent. During the protracted conflicts between patricians and plebeians there was no lack of disorders in the forum. Sometimes daggers were drawn in, on a few occasions, gangs of troublemakers managed to seize the capital by surprise attacks. But for whole centuries there was no case of a faction violently usurping power and massacring or exiling its adversaries. At the time when the Gracchi were slain, the legal procedure of voting was twice interrupted by bloodshed, and later on, when the vote of the commission to entrust command of the war in Asia to Sulla was annulled by violence, Sulla set a new example by entering the city at the head of an army. The legions had long been fighting outside of Italy, and so had become real standing armies suitable for acting as blind instruments in the hands of their generals. The civil wars that ensued were fought between regular armies, and the leader of the last army to win such a war was Octavianus Augustus. He changed the form of government permanently and founded a bureaucratic military monarchy. From then on, the regular army arrogated to itself the right to change not the form of the government but the head of the government. In feudal Europe civil conflicts and revolutions assumed, as they quite regularly assume among peoples that are feudally organized, the character of wars between factions of barons or local leaders. So in Germany, on the election of a new emperor, the barons and the free cities would often divide into two parties that fought each other back and forth, each following the sovereign of its choice and pronouncing him legitimate. Elsewhere, as in Sicily in the period of the conflicts between the Latin and Catalan nobilities, the contending parties disputed possession of the physical person of the king, or of the prince or princess who was heir to the crown. Such possession enabled a faction to take shelter under the wing of legitimacy and proclaim its adversaries rebels and traitors. For the same reasons, the Burgundians and Armagnacs in France fought for possession of the person of king or dauphin, see below, section 6. At other times the barons would align themselves under the standards of two rival dynasties, as happened in England during the Wars of the Roses. Whenever the whole of a nobility, or virtually the whole, rose unanimously against a sovereign, the revolution was soon complete, the king being easily overthrown and reduced to impotence. This latter case was not rare in any of the old feudal regimes. It was especially frequent in Scotland. As in civil conflicts in the Greek states and the Italian communes, so in these domestic conflicts between the barons of a given kingdom, the victorious party was wont, whenever possible, to dispossess the vanquished of their fiefs and distribute these among its own followers. Assassination and especially poisoning were fairly rare, but if the vanquished did not fall on the field of battle the executioner's axe was often waiting for them. All the noble family of the Chiaramondi perished on the scaffold at Palermo, and the flower of the old English nobility was exterminated on the scaffold, or on the field of battle, during the successive victories and defeats of the two houses of York and Lancaster. In France a number of Armagnacs were assassinated. Others were lynched by Paris mobs. In his turn, John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, died by an assassin's hand. As regards Mohammedan countries, one may ignore mere court intrigues that occasion the deposition and death of one sultan in the elevation of another. But if revolutions proper show a certain resemblance to the conflicts that were waged between cliques of nobles in feudal Europe, they also show traces, often, of a movement which we would nowadays call socialistic, though it usually is obscured and disguised as religious reform. The efforts of many Levantine and African sovereigns to surround themselves with regular troops serving for pay have proved fairly successful at one time or another. All the same, among most Muslim peoples, especially among peoples that do not take to cities but lead pastoral rather than agricultural lives, a very ancient tribal organization has been preserved, and uprisings of tribal chieftains, like those of the European barons, in support of some pretender to a throne or of the claims of some new dynasty have always remained possibilities. Among the tribes themselves, furthermore, some innovator is always coming along to preach a religious reform and claim to be leading Islam back to its pristine purity. If success smiles upon the agitation of such a person, we get a religious and social revolution.
In Near Eastern countries, and in North Africa too, there is not that class struggle between capitalists and proletarians that is characteristic of modern Europe, but for hundreds and hundreds of years an undercurrent of antagonism has persisted between the poor brigand tribes of the deserts and the mountain regions and the richer tribes that inhabit the fertile plains. Hostility is still more overt between the farmers and the wealthy, unwarlike populations of the coastal cities. It can hardly be said that Islam offers no pretext for revivals of the old equalitarian spirit, the old contempt for riches and enjoyments, that we find in a number of the early Hebrew prophets, in Isaiah, for instance, and in Amos, the herdsman of Tekoa. If Muhammad did not say that it was easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, he nonetheless loved simple ways, and among the joys of this world he prized only women and perfumes. Once eighty horsemen of the Beni Kend, a tribe recently converted to Islamism, presented themselves before him as ambassadors, in magnificent array and clad in silken garments. Straightway he reminded them that the new religion did not admit of luxury, and they at once tore their rich raiment to shreds. Omar, the second caliph, conquered many lands and endless treasure, but he ate frugally, sitting on the ground, and when he died his personal estate consisted of one tunic and three drachmas. That makes it easier to understand how the old Arab dynasties in North Africa, during the 11th and 12th centuries, came to be conquered and dispossessed by the religious reform of the Almoravides, who in their turn were overthrown by a similar movement, the reform of the Amahades, so-called. In both cases the desert and mountain tribes coaxed the reform doctrines along and used them to get the better of the wealthier and more cultured populations of the Tel, or zone along the sea. Like motives may readily be detected in the growth of the Wahhabi sect in Arabia and in the later fortunes of Mahdism along the Upper Nile. In the old days, once the Saracens were masters of the rich lands of Syria, Persia and Egypt, they forgot the frugality of the Sahaba, the men who had known the Prophet, and some of the latter, in their old age, had occasion to be scandalized at the luxury displayed by the Amiyad Caliphs of Damascus, who were to be far outdone in that respect by the Abbasid Caliphs of Baghdad. It goes without saying, therefore, that in the Almoravides and Amahades, too, human nature soon triumphed over sectarian ardors. Once they found themselves in the palaces of Fez and Cordoba, they forgot the simple life that they had preached and practiced on the tablelands beyond Atlas, and adopted the refinements of Oriental ease. If the Wahhabi, the modest and other Mohammedan reforms did not achieve the same results, that was because they enjoyed success in far smaller measure. 3. Revolutions and violent upheavals have not been rare in China. However, it is hard for us to divine the social causes of the very ancient ones. We know that the Celestial Empire passed through a number of different economic and political phases, and that it changed from the feudal state that it once was into a bureaucratic state. The motives and forms of its rebellions must certainly have changed in accordance with those changes. Of this much one can be sure. Whenever a dynasty had greatly declined in efficiency, when corruption of public officials overstepped the limits of endurance, when weak princes allowed women and eunuchs to rule in their places or wasted too much time in quest of the elixir of eternal life, some unruly governor, or some intrepid adventurer, would place himself at the head of insurgent bands, defeat the government troops and then, abetted by the general discontent, dispossess the old dynasty and found a new one. The new dynasty would show an improved energy for some generations. Then it too would weaken, and the old abuses would come to the fore again. Invasions of northern barbarians and Tibetans often provoked and facilitated such overturns, and, in fact, the whole country fell eventually under the dominion of the Mongols. Then gradually a powerful patriotic reaction ripened. Such outbursts of national spirit are not rare among peoples that possess ancient civilizations. We have traces of one in ancient Egypt on the expulsion of the Hyksos. Almost within our memory came the uprisings in Greece and Italy in the 19th century, toward the close of the 14th century of our era a group of enthusiastic and energetic men raised the standard of revolt against the Mongols, with a bonze, one hung Wu, at their head. It is noteworthy that the bonzes, or Buddhist monks, have always been recruited largely from the lowest classes of the Chinese population and, in our day at least, are held in very low esteem in all China. On the crest of a wave of national feeling this movement swept the country. The barbarians were driven beyond the Great Wall and Hung Wu became the founder of the Ming Dynasty, which governed the empire down to the middle of the 17th century, 1644. China meantime became an almost completely bureaucratized state. During the 19th century the country had another revolution. Though it did not succeed, it is worthy of mention in view of the analogy it offers to the revolution that had set a bonds, Hung Wu, on the throne. A war with the English, ending in the disadvantageous treaties of 1842 and 1844, had produced great disorder throughout the empire. In consequence, 
A revolt against the foreign dynasty of Manchu Tatars broke out in the neighborhood of Nanking, the ancient Ming capital and the heart of Chinese nationalism. The platform of the revolution called for the expulsion of foreigners and the establishment of a new religion, in which dogmas of Christianity were curiously intermingled with, and adapted to, the philosophical ideas and popular superstitions of the Chinese. A schoolmaster, an educated man of very low birth, a sort of fish out of water answering to the name of Hong Su Xian, was the supreme chief of the rebellion. A group of energetic, intelligent, ambitious men gathered about him, financed his agitation and helped him both in formulating his religious and philosophical creed and in directing his first acts of insurrection. The Chinese bureaucratic machine had been profoundly shaken at the time by the setbacks it had received and by the inferiority that it had exhibited with respect to the Europeans. Supported by public discontent, the rebels won rapid success at first. Entering Nanking in 1853, they proclaimed the Taiping, or Era of Universal Peace, in that city, the rebels, in fact, were commonly known to Europeans as Taipings. At the same time Hong Su Shine, who certainly was no ordinary man, was exalted to the rank of celestial emperor and became head of a new national dynasty. But in China too the brute force that is required for a successful revolution was to be found largely in the dregs of society. The rank and file of the army of universal peace had to be recruited largely from among deserters, fugitives from justice and, in general, from the mass of vagrants and vagabonds who abound in all great cities, in China as well as in Europe. Soon the leaders found themselves powerless to control the outrages of their followers. The Taiping bands carried pillage, desolation and slaughter everywhere. The insurrection lost all sight of its political idea. Lust for loot and blood gained the upper hand, and territories that fell into the hands of the rebels experienced all the horrors of real anarchy. A new war with England and France broke out in 1800 and there was a Mohammedan revolt in the northwest. Those misfortunes prolonged the anarchy in China for several years. But eventually the Chinese government was freed in some measure of its embarrassments and was able to dispatch forces in considerable numbers against the rebels. By that time the latter had lost all public sympathy and otherwise found themselves in a bad way. The early associates of Hong Su Kliayan, the only men connected with the revolt who had had a truly political outlook and broad views, had almost all lost their lives. Nanking was invested in Hong Su Xian, surrounded by a haphazard group of men who stood as ready to betray him as to rob others, lost all hope of offering further resistance. He took poison in his palace on June 30, 1864. Masters of Nanking, the imperial troops beheaded the young son of the dead rebel leader twenty days later and stifled in blood and atrocious cruelty a revolt that had long held on only by cruelty and terror. In the Celestial Empire, as normally happens in the Mohammedan countries and to a large extent in Europe, the political idea or ideal on which the revolution had rested at the start became clouded and was almost entirely lost from view the moment the period of action and realization came. Another point of contact between the Taiping insurrection and insurrections in Europe may be seen in the fact that in China too the ground for the revolutionary movement was prepared by secret societies. The influence of clandestine organizations in fomenting popular discontents and inspiring hatred of the foreigner is apparent in that country as early as the 18th century. So in our day, the revolution that overthrew the Manchu dynasty was due in large part to the work of secret societies. These organizations, at any rate, survived the Taiping revolt which they had helped to stir up, and to them seemed to have been due not a few murders of Europeans, which were committed in the intent of entangling the Peking government with one or another of the Western powers. As in countries that are much better known to us than China, the secret societies were joined now by ardent and disinterested patriots, now by criminals who use the bond of association to secure impunity in their crimes, and sometimes even by public officials who hope to further their careers. 4. Noteworthy among European revolutions is the type in which a subject people rises against its oppressors. Of that type were the insurrections in Sweden against Denmark, under Gustavus Vesa, in Holland against Spain, in Spain against France, in 1808, in Greece against Turkey, in Italy against Austria, in Poland against Russia. Such insurrections are more like foreign wars, or wars between peoples, than civil wars, and they are the ones that are most likely to succeed. In our day, however, in view of our huge standing armies, if an insurgent people is to have any great probability of victory it must already enjoy a sort of semi-independence, so that a portion of its population at least is well organized in a military sense. In Spain, in 1808, in addition to the famous guerrillas, the regular armies took an active part in support of the insurrection. In Italy, in 1848, the army of Piedmont played the principal role in the war against the foreigner, and the regular troops of Piedmont, in concert with their French allies, dealt the blows that decided the fate of the peninsula in 1859. 
In 1830 and 1831 again, Poland was able to hold out for almost a year against the Russian Colossus because a Polish army had previously been maintained as a part of the Russian army, and it espoused the cause of nationalism. The insurrection of 1863-1864 was conducted by mere bands of irregulars. It had less significant results and was suppressed with much less effort. To the same type of revolution belongs the American War of Independence against England. The American colonies enjoyed very broad privileges of autonomy even before 1776. When they joined in a federation and proclaimed their independence they had little difficulty in organizing an armed force, partly from the old militias of the various colonies and partly from volunteers. They were therefore able to hold off the troops that were sent by the mother country to subjugate them, until France intervened. Then they succeeded in emancipating themselves. When the Great Rebellion broke out, in 1642, England was not yet a bureaucratic state, and Charles I had only a small standing army at his command. In the beginning Parliament had the militias of the shires on its side. The rural nobility, the Cavaliers, bore the main brunt of the conflict on the side of the king. The Cavaliers were far better practiced in the military arts and won easy victories at first, but when Cromwell was able to organize, first a regiment, and then an army of permanent disciplined troops, conflict was no longer possible. At the head of his army the Lord Protector not only defeated the Cavaliers but subdued Scotland and Ireland put the levellers in their places, sent the long parliament home with scant ceremony and became absolute master of the British Isles. The English are great lovers of constitutional privileges. Remembrance of these doings made them long distrustful of standing armies. Charles II and James II were never provided with means for maintaining permanent military forces, and every effort was made to keep the county militias in good training. William of Orange himself, greatly to his regret, was obliged to send back to the continent the old Dutch regiments which he had led in overthrowing the last of the Stuarts. 5. Another social phenomenon of importance is the rural or peasant rebellion. Such uprisings were fairly frequent in Europe during the second half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th. They broke out in a number of widely separated communities. One remembers the revolts that took place in Russia early in the reign of Catherine II on the pretext of restoring to the throne one individual or another who tried to impersonate the murdered Tsar, Peter III. To the Spanish Rebellion of 1808, in which the entire nation took part, we have several times referred. Then there was the great insurrection in the Vendée in 1703, the Neapolitan Rebellion of 1709 against the Parthenopean Republic, the Calabrian Revolt against Joseph Bonaparte in 1808, and the one in the Tyrol in 1800. There have been a number of Carlist insurrections in Biscay and Navarre of the rural revolt that was captained by Monmouth in the day of James II, just before the glorious revolution Macaulay observes that that uprising was made possible because at that time every English yeoman was something of a soldier. In fact, a serious insurrection by peasants is possible only in places where they have had a certain habit of handling arms, or at least where hunting or brigandage, or family and neighborhood feuds, have kept people familiar with the sound of gunfire. Of the Russian movements mentioned, the most important was led by Pogakliev. On the whole those revolts rested on the hatred that peasants, Cossacks and all the plainsmen who were used to the freedom of the steppes felt for bureaucratic centralization, which was at that time gaining ground, and for the German employees of the government, who were looked upon as originally responsible for the bureaucracy's interference in the daily lives of the Russians. However, the revolting peasants were what we would now call loyalist, they maintained that the true Tsar was in their camp, and that the Tsarina who held the palaces at St. Petersburg and Moscow was a usurper. Sentiments that are conservative and at the same time opposed to excessive interference by the state are characteristic, in general, of the peasant insurrection, which as a rule occurs when some triumphing party of innovation seeks to require new sacrifices in the name of civilization or progress. The Vendians were dissatisfied with the Republic because it was persecuting their priests, and they were angered by the execution of Louis XVI. However, they did not rise en masse till March 1703, when the convention decreed general conscription. The Neapolitan peasantry, in 1799, besides having been shocked in their habits and beliefs by new modes of thinking, had been pillaged and heavily requisitioned by the French troops. In Spain, in 1808, not only had Catholic and national sentiments been grievously offended. It was alleged and believed that the French invaders were provided with handcuffs in large numbers, which were to be used to drag out of the country all young men who were eligible for enrollment in Napoleon's armies. The various Carlist insurrections in Biscay and Navarre were in large part caused by the jealousy with which those provinces cherished their old fueros, or local charters, which gave them virtual independence in local government and many immunities with respect to public burdens.
The initial leaders of rural insurrections are usually but little superior to the peasants themselves in education and social status. The famous Spanish Cabasilla Mina was a muleteer. In Naples in 1799 Bodio was a country lawyer. Pronio and Mamone had once been farm laborers, and Nunziant, at best, had been a sergeant in the army. Andreas Hofer, who led the Tyrolese revolt in 1809, was a well-to-do tavern keeper. The initial moves in the Yendian insurrection were led by Cathalino, a hack driver, and Stovelt, a game watchman. But if the higher classes happen to approve of the insurrectionary movement and it acquires power and weight, other leaders of a higher social status step forward very soon. In the Vendi the nobles were naturally hesitant because they better understood the difficulties of the enterprise, but the peasants went to their castles and persuaded them, or, in a sense, obliged them, to place themselves at the head of the rebellion. So Liscure, Bonchamps, La Roche Jacqueline and Charette de la Contre, gentlemen all, were drawn into the movement. Charette was a cold, shrewd man of indomitable will and tireless energy. He at once exhibited all the talents of the perfect party leader. Instead of curbing the excesses of his followers, he let them satisfy their grudges and repay old scores with a view to compromising them and so binding them irrevocably to the cause of the rebellion. Among all leaders of rural conservative revolts, the only one to compare with him is Zumalakar guy, a Basque, who was leader-in-chief of the first Carlist insurrection. He too had been an obscure country squire. Conservative peasant insurrections and urban revolts that are made in the name of liberty and progress have one trait in common. However short a time they may last, there immediately comes into evidence a certain type of person, a person who seems to be enjoying the fun and to be interested in prolonging it. The initial movement may be general in character, but very soon these individuals come to stand out in the crowd. Once they have abandoned their customary occupations, they are unwilling to return to them. The instinct for struggle and adventure grows upon them. They are people, in fact, who have no talent for getting ahead very far in the ordinary course of social life but who do know how to make themselves felt under exceptional circumstances such as civil wars. Naturally they want the exception to become the rule. After the first and grandest phase of the Vendian insurrection, which ended in the terrible rout at Savonet, the war dragged on for years and years, because about its leaders had gathered groups of resolute men who had become professional rebels and would turn to no other trade. This tendency is the more marked when revolution is a road to speedy fortune. That was the case in Naples, where Rodeo and Pronio became generals overnight, and Nunziant and Mam Mano were made colonels. The revolutionary leaven that was left in Spain by the six years of the war for independence fermented in the long series of civil wars that ensued, and in each case at the bottom of the insurrection were a number of adventurers who were hoping for fortune and advancement. Titles and ranks were easily gained in such tumults by serving one or another of the contending parties and deserting them in time. The habit of revolution that is contracted by certain persons further helps to explain the betrayals and inconsistencies that are not rare in civil upheavals. People who begin by fighting for a principle keep on fighting and rebelling after their cause has been won. They simply feel a need for rebelling and fighting. 6. Considered as social phenomena, the revolutions that broke out in France during the 19th century are especially interesting as due to very special political conditions, notably to the phenomenon of overbureaucratization. Not of this type was the Great Revolution of 1789. That was a real collapse of the classes and political forces which had ruled in France down to that time. During the revolution government administration and the army completely broke down, owing to inexperience in the National Assembly, to emigration and to the propaganda of the clubs. For some time they were unable to enforce respect for the decisions of any government. By July 1789, whole regiments had gone over to the cause of the revolution. From then on, non-commissioned officers and soldiers were carefully lured into the clubs, where they received the watchword of obedience to the resolutions of the revolutionary committees rather than to the commands of their officers. The Marquis de Bouy, commanding the Army of the East, had been unable to suppress a dangerous military insurrection at Metz. He wrote late in 1790 that, with the exception of a regiment or two, the army was rotten, that the soldiers were disposed to follow the party of disorder or, rather, whoever paid them best, and that they were talking in such terms openly. The powers, therefore, that had fallen from the hands of the king were not gathered up by any ministry that had the confidence of the constituent assembly. It belonged in turn to the clique, or to the man, who on a given day could get himself followed to Paris by a show of armed force, whether he were a Lafayette at the head of the National Guard or a Danton with a suburban mob armed with clubs and iron bars. Nevertheless, apparent even in those early days were the beginnings of a tendency that was to become stronger and stronger during the first half of the 19th century. Leaders of insurrections always tried to become masters of the individual or individuals who impersonated the symbol, or the institution, to which France, whether because, 
of ancient tradition or because of faith in new principles, was inclined to defer, and, once successful in that intent, they were actually masters of the country, see above, section 2. That is what the rioters of October 6, 1789, did when, obviously in obedience to a watchword, they went to Versailles and seized the person of the king. With the monarchy abolished, the National Convention became the goal of all surprises, such as the coup of May 31, 1793, which made the assembly that represented all France slave to a handful of Paris gutter snipes. The provinces tried to react, but in vain, because the army remained obedient to the orders that emanated from the capital in the name of the convention, though everybody knew that the convention was acting under compulsion. The same general acquiescence in everything that happened at the seat of government contributed greatly to the favorable outcome of the various coups d'état that took place under the directory, and down to the establishment of the Napoleonic Empire. But even more characteristic, perhaps, is what occurred in 1830, then again in 1848, and finally in 1870. First of all comes a battle, more or less protracted and sometimes relatively insignificant, with the detachment of soldiers that is guarding the buildings in the capital in which are assembled the representatives of the supreme power that has previously been recognized as legitimate. The famous February Revolution of 1848, which overthrew the monarchy of Louis Philippe, cost the lives of 72 soldiers and 287 civilians, either rioters or bystanders. Next, the mob, armed or unarmed, puts sovereigns and ministers to flight dissolves the assemblies and riotously forms a government. This government is made up of names more or less widely known to the country. The men mentioned take desks in the offices from which the former heads of the government have been wont to govern, and then, almost always with the connivance or acquiescence of the ordinary clerks, they telegraph to all France that, by the will of the victorious people, they have become masters of the country. The country, the administrative departments, the army, promptly obey. It all sounds like a story of Aladdin's wonderful lamp. When by chance or by guile that lamp fell into the hands of someone, even a mere child or an ignorant boy, at once the genii were his blind slaves and made him richer and more powerful than any sultan of the East. And no one, furthermore, ever asked how or why the precious talisman came into the boy's possession. It may be objected that in 1830 the government had become an obedient tool of the legitimist party, that it had given up all pretense to legality, that a large part of France was definitely opposed to the political policy which the government was following and even that a part of the army responded feebly, or not at all, at the decisive moment. Also, the catastrophe of 1870 might account in part for the change of government that took place in France at that time. But no element of that sort figured in the sudden revolution of 1848. Neither the chambers nor the bureaucracy nor the army were sympathetic to the republican government at that time. The majority of the departments were frankly opposed to it. Louis Blanc himself confesses as much. After rejecting as insulting the hypothesis that the republic had a minority in its favor, he admits that a nationwide vote might have declared against a republican form of government. And again he says, no more, no less, why not face the facts? Most of the departments in February 1848, were still monarchical. Lamartine, too, in speaking of the impression that the revolution of 1848 made in France, admits that it was surrounded by an atmosphere of uneasiness, doubt, horror and fright that had never been equaled, perhaps, in the history of mankind. In Paris itself the National Guard had been wavering in February because it wanted to see an end put to the Guizot ministry. However, it was manifesting a reactionary frame of mind in the following March and April. A few hours of vacillation were nonetheless enough to drive Louis Philippe, his family and his ministers not only from Paris but from France, to abolish two chambers and to enable a provisional government, a mere list of names shouted at a tumultuous crowd that was milling about the Palais Bourbon, to assume from one moment to the next full political control over a great country, France. Citizen Cossudier, wanted by the police the day before, went to police headquarters on the afternoon of February 20, 1848, at the head of a group of insurgents, his hands still smudged with gunpowder. That evening he became chief of police, and the next day all the heads of branches and the service promised him loyal cooperation and, willing or unwilling, kept their promises. Police headquarters were, moreover, the only office where the Rank and file of the personnel was changed, the old municipal guards being dismissed and replaced by monognards, former comrades in conspiracy and at the barricades of the new chief, who afterwards uttered the famous epigram that he stood for order through disorder. In the preface to his History of 1848, Louis Blanc decides that Louis Philippe fell mainly because his sponsors were supporting him for selfish reasons and not because of personal devotion. According to Blanc, the bourgeois king had very few enemies and many confederates but at the moment of danger failed to find one friend. That reasoning, 
it seems to us, has only a very moderate value. Not all the people who support a given form of government have to feel a personal affection, or have a disinterested friendship, for the individual who stands at the head of that form of government. Actually, such sentiments can be sincerely felt only by the few persons, or the few families, who are actually intimate with him. Political devotion to a sovereign, or even to the president of a republic, is quite another matter. The main cause of the frequent sudden upheavals in France was the excessive bureaucratic centralization of that country, a situation that was made worse by the parliamentary system itself. Public employees had grown accustomed to frequent changes in chiefs and policies, and they had learned from experience that much was to be gained by pleasing anyone who was seated at the top and that much was to be lost by displeasing such a person. Under such a system what the great majority in the army and in the bureaucracy want, and also the great majority in that part of the public that loves order, whether by interest or by instinct, is just a government, not any particular government. Those, therefore, who stand de facto at the head of the state machine always find conservative forces ready to sustain them, and the whole political organism moves along in about the same way whatever the hand that sets it in motion. Certainly, under such a system, it is easier to change the personnel that holds supreme power, as happened in France after 1830, 1848 and 1870, than it is to change the actual political trend of a society. For if the more radical change is the object, governors who have emerged from the revolution itself are forced to prevent it by the conservative elements which are their instruments and at the same time their masters. That was the case in June 1848 and in 1871. Unquestionably, also, a strong sense of the legality and legitimacy of an earlier government would prevent submissive obedience to a new regime issuing from street riding. Hot for a feeling of that sort to rise ere it assert itself requires time and tradition, and for France the changes that had occurred down to 1870 were too rapid to enable any tradition to take root. In France and in a large part of Europe, during the 19th century, revolutionary minorities were able to rely not only on the sympathy of the poor and lettered masses but also, and perhaps in the main, upon the sympathies of the fairly well-educated classes. Rightly or wrongly, young people in Europe were taught for the better part of a century that many of the most important conquests of modern life had been obtained as a consequence of the Great Revolution, or by other revolutions. Given such an education, it is not to be wondered at that revolutionary attempts and successful revolutions were not viewed with any great repugnance by the majority of people, at least as long as they offered no serious menace or actual injury to material interests. Naturally, such feelings will be stronger and more widespread in countries where the de facto or legal governments themselves have issued from revolutions, so that, while condemning rebellions in general, they are obliged to glorify the one good, the one holy insurrection from which they sprang themselves. 7. One of the principal agencies by which revolutionary traditions and passions have been kept alive in many countries in Europe has been the political association, especially the secret society. In such societies ruling groups receive their education and are trained in the arts of inflaming passions in the masses and leading them toward given ends. When it becomes possible to write the history of the 19th century impartially, much space will have to be given to the effectiveness with which the Masonic lodges, for example, managed to disseminate liberal and democratic ideals, and so cause rapid and profound modifications of intellectual trends in a great part of European society. Unless we assume an active, organized and well-managed propaganda on the part of such groups, it would be hard to explain how it has come about that certain points of view that were the property of highly exclusive coteries in a select society at the end of the 18th century can now be heard expressed in the remotest villages by persons and in environments that certainly have not been changed by any special education of their own. Nevertheless, if associations, open or secret, excel as a rule in laying the intellectual and moral foundations for revolutions, the same cannot be said of them when it comes to rousing the masses to immediate action, to stirring up the armed movement at the given point on the appointed day. Under that test societies and conspiracies fail at least ten times to every time they succeed. The reason is evident. To launch a revolution it is not enough to have at one's disposal the crowd of jobless adventurers, ready for any risk, that are to be found in any great city. The cooperation of considerable elements from the public at large is also necessary. Now the masses are stirred only at times of great spiritual unrest caused by events which governments either cannot avoid or fail to avoid. Such unrest cannot be created, it can only be exploited, by revolutionary societies. The disappointment of some great hope, a sudden economic depression, a defeat suffered by a nation's army, a victorious revolution in a neighboring country, such are incidents that are well calculated to excite a multitude, provided it has previously been prepared for the shock by a revolutionary propaganda. If the rebellious group has developed a permanent organization and knows how to take advantage of such a moment, it can hope for success, 
but if it rushes into action without any support from exceptional circumstances, it is unfailingly and easily crushed, as happened in France in the uprisings of 1832, 1834 and 1840. In France, Spain and Italy there are a few cities in which it is relatively easy to lead masses to the barricades. That is one of the many effects of habit and tradition. Once a population has exchanged shots with a constituted government and overthrown it, it will feel, for a generation at least, that it can make a new try any time with favorable results, unless repeated and bloody failures have chance to undeceive it. So it is with individuals. When they have been under fire a number of times they acquire a sort of martial education and fight better and better. That is one of the reasons why the Parisian workmen fought so stubbornly in June 1848, though, as Blanc explains in his history of that episode, the habit of discipline that they had acquired in the national armories also figured in their deportment to some extent. The revolutionary elements fought even better in 1871 because, as part of the Paris National Guard, they had been carefully organized, trained and armed. And yet, in spite of all the advantages of time, place and circumstance that a revolutionary movement may enjoy, in our day, because of our huge standing armies and the pecuniary resources and the instruments of warfare that only constituted powers are in a position to procure, no government can be overthrown by force unless the men who are in charge of it are themselves irresolute or lose their heads, or at least unless they are paralyzed by dread of assuming responsibility for a repression involving bloodshed. Eleventh-hour concessions, last-minute orders and counter-orders, the falterings of those who hold legal power and are morally bound to use it, these are the real and most effective factors in the success of a revolution, and the history of the days of February, 1848, is highly instructive in that regard. It is a fatal illusion to believe that where there is vacillation and fear of being compromised in the higher places, subordinates will be found to assume responsibility for energetic measures of their own, or even for effective execution of perplexing and contradictory orders. We have seen that if standing armies are well handled they can become effective instruments in the hands of legal government without disturbance to the juridical equilibrium. We ought therefore to examine these complex and delicate organisms in order to see how they have come into being and how they can be kept from degenerating.